Okay, I've got something to share with you um, regarding a survey that I put on the hoof page. Um, the survey was this. Please take the survey. Where on the foot of the horse do you think that farrier and veterinary science teach that the hoof bears the weight of the horse? Okay, so we're going to look at the the opinions here of what people think and then I'm going to show you what they really teach and really believe and if you're like me it will just leave you scratching your head and you will also understand why so many horses go lame okay um, and you're gonna have to learn a little bit of the history between blacksmiths or farriers and vets in this deal here um, why they are so connected together all right because um, the vets learn pretty much everything they know about the foot from the farriers okay I'll explain to you why that is okay so again this was the question where on the foot of the horse do you think that farrier and veterinary science teach that the hoof bears the weight of the horse okay we're gonna look at the Look at the answers here. First of all, from Juanita Rayner, I would guess that most would teach that the hoof wall is weight bearing. Otherwise, how do they justify shoes? But I, I w see, I don't know what text is. What's IMO? Uh, but I imagine weight bearing is shared. Maybe that's what that means. Um, weight bearing is shared between the hoof wall, bars, sole, and frog, i.e. the entire bottom of the foot. Now, common sense would tell us that, right? Because every single creature on the face of the planet bears its weight on the bottom, somewhere on the bottom of the foot. Usually the whole bottom of the foot of any animal is somehow sharing weight bearing I mean that's just physical laws the laws of nature the laws of the universe is not that correct okay now Lena Ronbeck um, states this Boker she's talking about Dr. Boker who's an anatomist uh, and does hoof research um, Boker who has his own equine foot research center at Michigan State University okay believes in central loading I hope more vets and farriers read this research okay um, central loading uh, well, I don't I'm not sure what that means like the, the center of the foot I'll have to read his research but irregardless it's on the bottom of the foot because I know that dr. Boker talks about how he doesn't believe in what he calls peripheral loading the peripheral of the, the hoof is the hoof wall the wall on the outside of the hoof now um, just a minute here okay now before we go any farther let's look at the bottom of the foot so we know what we're talking about again I'm asking where do you think farriery and veterinary science you know farrier your horseshoe sure used they used to be called blacksmiths okay where do they believe the horse bears its weight okay um, so so far people are saying the hoof wall would be the rim of the wall right here see this is the big debate between uh, barefoot natural hoof care um, and uh, veterinary and farrier science what they teach as truth okay is this big debate on this does, where does the horse bear the weight okay common sense right tells us got to be down here or somewhere is it not that correct okay so um, so the fairies believe that the horse bears the weight on the hoof wall here and so what they will do is they'll take a horseshoe and they put it on the hoof wall and a lot of times they'll most of the time all the time they must pare away some of the sole here so that the sole is not bearing any of the weight on the shoe okay 
Now we will go back. But before I go back, I have to make a point. One reason they say that the horse should not bear any weight here on the soul is because then the soul will shove into um, there's an artery that runs along here called the circumflex artery okay they say that will damage that artery but um, I just noticed this before I go on um, first of all you're looking at the bottom of a foot here right okay this soul there's a soul ridge here that grows from right here um, first of all this soul doesn't even uh, come to the bottom of the foot Do you see what I'm saying here okay here's the soul right here I hope I hope this cursor is working I did a video where it didn't work made everything very un understandable okay see what I'm saying the soul here okay um, it's not directly underneath the artery just so you know okay let's go back and read some more comments all right and anyway uh, Lena gives us um, a, a link to Equin foot laboratory all right um, we're not gonna go read all that but anyway he he believes different than what farriers believe and veterinarians believe the standard teaching in all the schools in all the books everywhere okay so far um, they believe that farriers and vets believe that the horse bears the weight on the hoof wall okay Susie Susie says on the wall ie in other words uh, peripheral loading that's what it's called peripheral loading horses bear the weight on the wall okay um, Marquita Maravova sorry Marquita Marqueta Marqueta um, she says they teach wall is bearing weight but truth is it's wall with periphery of the soul together I think okay I and I think uh, that you're probably right um, but you're gonna gonna find out what they really teach and it will surprise you even more okay again er, they believe that farriers and vets think that the wall bears the weight it's not that correct Lucy dare mainly wall with some believing the soul I have found though the last five years of trimming my own three and a friend's uh, entourage minis to drafts that it seems best to allow for heels um, to be the main weight bearing point with support like our arches um, to come from the sole and hoof wall with occasional aid from the frog when the ground is soft just like after a good rain for emergency breaks <laughs> I like that still wondering about the frogs idea myself okay next one is Renee Harrison primary weight bearing is the hoof wall Jeanette Olafson hoof wall I think they say Daphne Findlay I think the wall also Natasha Natasha I'm not gonna try and pronounce your last name I am sorry I don't want to embarrass myself with my lack of knowledge um, also the hoof wall Hannah says hoof wall Harriet Filmer says wall uh, Sandra says hoof wall Adria Kennedy agree wall and Jantine says the wall okay now if we were to survey a um, hundred thousand people 90 nine percent of them a hundred thousand people with horses on what they think their farrier and veterinarian believes 90 some percent of them would say the hoof wall okay remember that all right now I'm going to show you what they 
believe and explain it to you. Okay, um, now to understand this, we need to go to just a second, we'll get this in view here. Okay, this is their page, um, their lab, for, lab four foot dissection. Okay, their ungulate dissection page. <coughs> um, parts of the hoof and horn producing dermis. Okay, so this is what your vets are being taught. And this is, I'm going to tell you right now, and I'll show you the history of this. This is what they got from the farriers and the blacksmiths back in the early 1800s when the vet schools were first opening and trying to get a go and stuff. Um, anyway, at that time, the blacksmiths and the farriers were basically the, the horse doctors. Okay? And so um, <clears throat> most of their knowledge they got from the blacksmiths and the farriers way back in the 1700s or early 1800s. And uh, okay, so we're going to see what they believe here. And then I'm going to explain to you how this works out. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Instructor commentary. Okay, I wish I had something to write with here. Okay, well, I'm just going to show it to you. Here's the instructor commentary. Okay, here's going to be your dissection images right here. Okay. Um, that we'll, we'll take a look at. So, um, we're going to read this. And you're going to find out where they believe the horse bears the weight. Okay? Okay. First of all, you're going, to, you're going to find not only is it strange where they believe the horse bears the weight, um, but what they think about the hoof and its contents is strange as well. Okay. It says, the foot is difficult to define. But a common definition of the equine foot is the hoof and its contents. The hoof and its contents. Okay? Um, this leaves structures such as the collateral cartilages and P2 partly within and partly without the hoof. That's because uh, it, it, in the foot, the, the cartilage is... Um, above as you see on your foot is above um, the hairline and below it okay uh, the hoof capsule uh, or, or the hoof is the capsule of the foot so the term hoof capsule is redundant redundant they, we just don't use that term anymore um, we just call it the hoof the hoof and its contents that's the foot of the horse. That's the way they view the foot of the horse. Okay. The hoof is horny tissue produced by specialized dermis. That's the coriums. We talk about the frog corium, the sole corium, um, the coronary corium where it grows the hoof wall. Okay. The hoof, it, hoof wall is produced by the coronary dermis and the laminar deuces uh, dermis produces the horny lamina on the inside of the hoof wall. Now here we go. We're going to see something here. Laminar units are formed by the interdigitation of horny sensitive, insensitive lamina with the adjacent sensitive dermal lamina. Okay, let's look at that. I want I want to show you what exactly what he's talking about here. So hold on. Okay, here is the insensitive lamina that he's talking about right here on the inside of the hoof wall. And just a minute here. There it is again, right there. Just a second here. Okay, and here is the sensitive lamina. 
So these are interlocked, um, like sheets of paper, okay? Like if you shuffled two separate sheets of paper and they're all locked, like, like about 600 sheets of paper, because you have about 600 of these around the foot or more, and uh, 600 of, of these right here, and they all interlock, and that's what uh, um, connects the foot to the, to the side of the foot. Let's see if I can find something else to show you here. Okay, there's the insensitive lamina. Okay. Here again, um, this would be the connection of the of the insensitive lamina right here, right there, and then the sensitive lamina right here. You see how they connect? Okay, and that then um, also th there's even more connections on each little one of these. Um, it's way stronger than Velcro, believe me. Okay, so that's the lamina he's talking about. Well, here, here, this shows it. This is the sensitive lamina right here. Well, wait a minute, or is it? No, right here. Okay, I think, anyway, one's sensitive, one's insensitive lamina, but this is how they're connected together. Each one of those little leaves then is like this. So see, it's it's really connected. But the thing about it is, is it's all what you call dovetailed. That's you know what dovetailing is. Just a minute, and I'll show you. Okay, this is what is meant by dovetail. Now, um, this is how they connect, um, like the the sides of a drawer together. They'll dovetail it, and then they'll glue this in there. They'll slide it in, and then they'll glue it in there, and so it's really stuck in there. Okay, but in the case of <clears throat> the horse's foot, the lamina is dovetailed all the way up uh, and down interconnected. Now, you see how this slides in there? You can slide it in and slide it out, right? Okay, well, uh, you, that's the way it is with the hoof wall. It's dovetailed, and those lamina are connected together, but they're all dovetailed so that the wall, as it grows, can slide down the sensitive lamina and where it connects with the sole and dovetails with the sole at the white line and then they grow together a certain length and then it grows out the bottom it's dovetailed this is why a lot of time if the wall is loaded in a certain place too much you'll see it jam upwards Okay, and you'll see the, the coronary band or the hairline rise because that part of the wall has been weighted too much and not trimmed enough, and so it jams back upwards because it's dovetailed. It slides down. Okay, um, I wanted to look at one more example of dovetailing. Here is something that isn't glued together. It's dovetailed. Um, this is a, a like a book holder. All right, and so you can move it, slide it up and down here so it will hold the books. This is dovetailed. This is the same way uh, the, the insensitive lamina is connected to the sensitive lamina of the inner foot, and it's, as it grows, it slides down. It slides down to where it meets the white, uh, the sole. It develops that what we call the white line, which is really yellow, where they are dovetailed together. And then it continues to grow with the sole to the ground, or, or at the length, like your sole will grow as, as the ultimate thickness about an inch. After that, it will exfoliate. So usually the wall grows past the sole. The reason it can do that is because all that lamina is dovetailed and the wall slides down the internal foot's lamina as it grows. Okay, so um, you've got lamina leaves like this, but it's made out of hoof wall here, okay, um, that's very, very white that, that goes in between all these and it's dovetailed and it starts growing from here 
it's all connected into here. This produces some of it too, I guess. But what it is, is it's all dovetailed together. And this starts growing here and it slides down this sensitive lamina here. It slides down that till it meets up with the sole right here. And then sole and wall grow together um, till they get about here. And then the wall will grow past the sole. And the reason it can do that is because it is dovetailed. OK. OK, here's another one. Here's the sensitive lamina of the inner foot. This is living tissue. OK, and um, you can't really see it here because I kind of painted that red when I was messing with this. But this is this hoof wall. OK, or the insensitive, very most inner part of the lamina here that connects into here. All right, again, it's dovetailed. It starts growing up here, OK, and it grows down this way. It meets up with the sole right here. The, the sole here and the wall right here, they dovetail together. And now they grow as thick as the sole will grow to right here. And then the wall um, is pushed down and grows beyond the sole. And that's the wall you trim off right there. But it can do that because it is all dovetailed together. <clears throat> OK, so now you know <clears throat> when this talks about, um, I'm going to read it again. The hoof wall is produced by the coronary, <coughs> excuse me, dermis, and the lamina produces, dermis produces the horny lamina. That's the insensitive lamina on the inside of the hoof wall, okay, that connects to the sensitive lamina that covers um, the upper outer exterior of the inner foot that I showed you, okay. <coughs> Laminar units. Now, a laminar unit, okay, would be uh, one piece of the insensitive uh, lamina from the inner hoof wall joined to one piece of the sensitive lamina from the inner foot. Do you understand? <clears throat> That's a laminar unit. So a laminar units are formed by the integration of horny insensitive lamina with the adjacent sensitive dermal, dermal lamina. <clears throat> about six, now listen to this, about 600 laminar units. Are you ready for this? About 600 laminar units. OK, <clears throat> sorry. I need a little drink here. All right. 600 laminar units. <clears throat> Let's stop there for a minute. <clears throat> and uh, let's look at what he's talking about. Just a second. Just a second. OK. <clears throat> this would be about 300 laminar units. OK, this area right here. These are your laminar units right here. This is the lamina. Remember, it's joined together with the insensitive lamina of this piece of hoof wall here. OK, so all together from here all the way around to the other side of the other heel, you have around 600 of these. OK, and they're very, very fine. Like I can't even show how fine they are. Um, looking at this here, just a second. OK, here you see more of what they're like. Very uh, paper, not even not even as thick as a piece of paper. They are so fine. Um, and they're stuck together right here. Um, it's hard to even see how thin and sensitive and delicate they really, really are. Um, uh, just a second here. I'll see. It's 
it's a very very delicate very delicate easily torn easily damaged see pulling the hoof capsule off damage some of them right there you see that see once you take the hoof capsule off it's it's really difficult to keep them totally separated they're so thin and so very very delicate I want to get to the end of these pictures okay okay you see how thin these are see that is what they're like this is the insensitive lamina I think I have I'm just see I was just taking the uh, pictures of the end of the insensitive lamina right here that's in the heel Anyway, I was looking for a picture of ah here we go okay there you see you see you see how when you take the hoof capsule off you see how many of them there are there's one in accordance on the foot as well you just can't see it because once you take that hoof capsule off it's really hard to keep them separate because it's living it well in this case it wasn't living it's very delicate delicate tissue and again, it's all connected in between this insensitive lamina of the inner hoof wall and this hoof wall slides down, is dovetailed to and slides down the sensitive lamina of the inner foot. And this slides down and eventually, once it's all the way down, it gets cut off. Okay, you see here how um, it this part this sensitive lamina right here was pulled off of the foot when I took the hoof capsule off so okay so now you have an idea of the sensitive delicate structure of the inner foot and the inner hoof wall and the the foot all right okay so now let's go back okay um, let's go back we know what laminar units are right uh, okay uh, he says about 600 laminar units okay get this next statement bear most or all of the body weight in the standing horse let me tell you something everybody said pretty much everybody said in that um, survey poll whatever you want to call it that they believe that their farrier and their veterinarian believe that the horse bears the weight on the hoof wall is not that correct they believe that the horse bears the hoof wall bears his weight on the hoof wall on this right okay so so again we all thought that they believe the horse bears the weight on the wall right but that is actually not what they believe let's read it again okay what do they believe here about 600 laminar units remember it described what the laminar units this is the instructor commentary on this dissection of a horse's foot okay about 600 laminar units bear most or all of the body weight in the standing horse so see you are wrong in thinking that your vet and your farrier believe that the horse bears the weight on the rim of the wall they do not believe that the horse bears the weight on the rim of the wall they believe and this belief goes back hundreds of years okay they believe that the lamina the lamina bears the weight of the standing horse 
And this is why. This is why when a farrier uh, shoes a horse, he will pair out the sole so that the wall is sticking above the sole, and then he will put the shoe on the foot on the rim of the wall. Do you understand that? Because what that does is it transfers all of the weight to the side of the foot and to the lamina. In other words, they do not believe that the horse bears the weight on the wall here. That's not what bears the weight. See, now they are going to pare out all this sole so there's no weight on it. They do not believe that the wall bears the weight. They believe that the side of the wall here bears the weight, that the lamina bears the weight. Now, what they do is they just trim away and pare away the sole and set the hoof wall on a shoe to transfer the weight to the side of the foot, to the lamina. Do you understand that? They do not believe that the wall, the bottom of the wall bears the weight. Now that's where they attach the shoe. They believe that this sensitive lamina here and the insensitive lamina of the inner hoof wall they believe that this is what should bear the weight and so this is why they do I'm going to show you something here okay this is a quote from a friend of mine and a picture of a hoof she's a trimmer okay and she just got a new client and the horse had shoes on was recently shod in fact and uh, my friend did not understand what farriers and vets really believe about where the horse is supposed to bear the weight and therefore what they do to the foot in preparing it for the shoe to force the foot to bear the weight not even on the bottom but on the sides of the foot on the sensitive and insensitive lamina of the sides of the foot which are dovetailed okay now we're gonna read this quote she sent me a picture of the foot and then she described it like this it looked like his soles had been pared out and then the farrier charged the lady seventy dollars to put on leather pads and fill with some sort of rubber compound and the walls were really really thin uh, but sticking down like half an inch so strange and all bruised and awful okay why was this so strange because this is standard practice okay to pair out the sole to force the foot to be on the wall okay to transfer all of the weight to the insensitive lamina and the sensitive lamina what they call a laminar unit okay this is what they believe and that's why this is such an abomination what they believe because this belief goes back into the dark ages no they do not believe that the horse bears the weight on the wall or anywhere on the bottom of the foot really they believe that the horse bears the weight on the side of the foot here okay they believe that the horse bears the weight on this right there that's where they force the horse to bear all of his weight by paring out the sole and putting on a metal shoe around the perimeter 
like so. That forces this wall. Okay, uh, wh what I want you to do, take your fingernail, okay, and tap it on the table, okay, and feel how you can feel that tap through your whole nail bed because the nail bed of your fingernail is the equivalent in a sense to the sensitive and insensitive lamina of the inner foot and the inner of the outer foot and the inner capsule okay so when you load that horse's foot on the wall and transfer all the weight to the side of the foot here it's just like okay well that's like forcing you to walk on your not on your tiptoes but on the tip of your toe nails see not on your tiptoes like you just imagine a ballerina okay and they're gonna force her to grow her toenails long and put her in these little shoes that force her not to bear her weight which is hard enough on the tips of her toes but on the tips of her toenail okay that is the equivalent to what they're doing here and some Yahoo come up with this some guy hundreds and hundreds of years ago and so blacksmiths and farriers believed this and then when veterinarians um, started developing schools for vets and horse doctors and animal doctors okay before that the farriers and the blacksmiths were considered the the experts and the the doctors and all that and so um, for the vets to even get going they had to kiss up to all the blacksmiths and the farriers just so uh, they could get anywhere all right so so they made this little marriage in hell is what it did the vets with the blacksmiths they are joined together you should research this it's a very interesting subject okay this is the uh, British veterinary journal volume 23 from 1862 um, <clears throat> it's a lecture to new vets and types of people to beware of um, what we call blacksmiths or farriers were at the top of the list um, hence begins a marriage between the two trades made in hell now I wrote that but this is out of an old book here out of an old as I say veterinary journal 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 right okay so veterinary schools were just up and coming it was kind of a new deal you know veterinary science and stuff they're turning it into a science okay so they had but there were other people who were practicing veterinary medicine um, uh, at the time and the biggest ones were for horses anyway were the farriers they were the trusted experts okay so um, there this guy is telling young vets on who to be aware of and watch out for okay um, so existing practitioners these people were practicing medicine but they didn't have to have a license okay uh, he says there is now an additional drawback to the young practitioner has to encounter and that is the opposition and effrontery from quote existing practitioners some of whom I believe in fact I know are respectable honest hard-working men always endeavoring to do their best for the animals they are called upon to treat and are in every way worthy of recognition okay but can this be said of the majority of them <laughs> and I'm telling you the same is true today okay a large number of whom are blacksmiths period or it might be a comma others are dealers horse traders others are pig jobbers I don't know what that is exactly and castrators okay etc in fact they're composed of nearly every grade of man about animals men whom we have not a word to say against as such 
neither should we so long as they even practiced under their true title but do they uh, I can confidently say no uh, one had even the audacity to tell me that he had been up to London and passed the college and got his qualification and most of them inform their customers grooms and everybody they come into contact with that they have passed the London College and have as good a qualifications as any other veterinary surgeon although both these epitaphs may be true inasmuch as each and all of them may have passed by the outside of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons when going through Red Lion Square and each of them has as good a legal right to practice veterinary medicine and surgery as any member of the RCVS see at that time um, there were no laws restricting the practice of veterinary medicine to anybody see okay um, again veterinary colleges were just kind of up and coming a new thing okay he says still I think you will all agree with me that such sayings are false and misleading because they are uttered with a view of making the general public believe that they have studied and passed the required examination prescribed by the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons just as its members have this trickery and deception is what we complain of for although these existing practitioners as they are legally styled may use the title veterinary surgeon yet they hold no certificate neither have they passed any examination nor have they been educated in any veterinary colleges okay now let me explain something here that happened um, because so many people revered the blacksmiths and their knowledge okay the veterinarians had to really brown nose it up with the farriers um, and because the, the the veterinarians really weren't weren't taught much about feet they relied on these men to teach them about uh, about that and so there was very little research really done on the foot itself they kind of left that to the blacksmiths the feet area okay now um, I said something here just a second here what I wrote this darn thing I said blacksmiths were favored by the king and by all in regards to the tradesmen uh, newcomer vets had to bow down to them to survive okay and as a result ultimately the whole foot issue was put in the blacksmiths hands and so this is why you have this strange marriage between blacksmiths and veterinarians even today and most of the information and knowledge that the veterinarians have and that they teach in their colleges about the foot of the horse come from the farriers and most of that knowledge comes from the medieval ages um, and tradition and is not based on any true science whatsoever okay okay but what they will do because of what they believe they and maybe they don't always mean to but they will fudge the science to make it look like what they think is true okay and they, this biased thing that they are already taught then when they look at the hoof you know their minds have been corrupted all right and so they're not seeing the truth of that foot okay hold on here okay now we're gonna go back to the University of Minnesota site okay and their dissection page and I want you to look at some how they have prepared a cadaver foot okay now look how they have prepared it so that the wall is longer than the sole 
So therefore, when they're teaching this thing that uh, uh, the soul does not bear the weight, but the wall bears the weight, and you have these students that don't know nothing, you know, and they're trusting these people that are teaching them, and this is a tradition that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation to generation, okay, you don't expect to go to school and be taught a falsehood, do you? You know, you go trusting them people and you pay a lot of money for it, right? Okay, so they're sitting in class. They don't know nothing anyway, all right? And so th they're shown this, something like this, and taught that the lamb and a bear all the way. And then it's explained to them. They're shown this picture, okay? Notice how the hoof wall extends beyond the sole. And there's no shoe on this foot, so this looks like it might be the natural foot. Also, I want you to notice something else. Okay, in none of, well, one picture, you, you see a picture of the actual foot because it's showing the lamina. All right, but what did they describe the foot as? The, it's described as the hoof with its contents. When farriers and veterinarians look at a horse's foot they do not actually see the inner foot okay that there is a real whole foot in there they see this and also when they have an x-ray okay this is all you see on the x-ray right here okay just this bone you don't see none of this you don't see a whole foot in there or the dermis the skin on that foot you just see this coffin bone you know to them it's just a uh, uh, a container with some parts in it all right and so so uh so right away this picture and this foot is prepared in such a way as to make it seem true that the foot somehow by burying the weight on the very rim here which is transferred right up to here to the lamina right here see and remember it's dovetailed right it slides down well, and we know that when it's weighted, it can slide up and jam up into this coronary band and push up about so far. All right, so, okay, so let's say a farrier comes along and he wants to prepare this foot for a shoe. Let's say that um, this horse has been trimmed just like this. This is a pasture trim here. He's going to leave a little bit of wall sticking out there for that horse to walk on, right? But let's say after a, a little bit of time that the horse um, has gotten a lot of movement, he's worn some wall down here. All right, here, I'll show you. Okay, so let's say that um, the wall gets worn down or to make the wall level, all right, he's got to come in here and he has to rasp this wall down to the level of the sole right here see there okay he he rasped this wall down to the level of the sole there you go you got your sole right here um, <clears throat> okay now he's gonna have to come in there because you can't have this sole here to get to get the whole wall level let's take off a little more okay because you know hoof walls get kind of uneven and level and flared and stuff like that and so you want to set you want it flat and level and you want to set a shoe on there okay now he can't have it like this he's got to come in and he's got to pair out the sole here let's see he's got to come out here and he's got to pair out some sole Okay, all right, then he can come in and he can, let's see here, he can put his shoe on the rim of that wall. There we go. Something like that. Okay, there's, there's the shoe. All right, now. This transfers the weight. Again, where does it transfer it up to? Transfer it's up right here to the lamina. The sensitive lamina, 
that's on the exterior of the foot right here and the insensitive lamina that joins with it, which is called the laminar units, of which there are about 600. And remember, they're very fine, and this is called sensitive lamina because it's so delicate and sensitive and fine, right? Okay, so that's great. So then, um, let's say every uh, th that you know the foot gets a little distorted the wall let's say grows out this way and let's say the sole here gets flat and thinner right in here okay um let's see if i can do that okay i'm using it i can't can't do it like i usually would to imitate this so uh I'll just have to do it a different way. Just a second here. Okay. Okay, let's say the wall flares out a bit like this. Okay. Okay, now what happens to this sole here, okay, is that um, it's going to thin out and it's going to stretch with the wall like this you see there okay so then the farrier is going to come along and uh just a second here let me take out some of this here okay He's going to come along and he's going to rasp down to try and get this level again. Okay. Okay, and um, he's going to have to take out some more of this sole here so that none of it, see how this is flat here? So that none of it is bearing weight on the ground. So he's going to have to come along here. Well, just a second here and pair out this sole again. So that he can set a shoe. On this wall. Let's see, let's let's make a nice shoe here. Again, to transfer the weight up here to the insensitive and sensitive lamina, because again, where do they believe the horse bears the weight? On the bottom here? No, not at all. They only put the shoe on the bottom of the wall and pare away the sole to transfer the weight up the hoof wall and onto the side of the foot right here. Do you see that? Okay, so as the wall stretches, as the foot gets pared down, the sole gets thinner and thinner and thinner right in here. You see that? Well, I'm going to show you what ultimately happens by another picture they have here. Okay, here's our pictures. All right, here's your foot, your normal foot. Okay, look here. What is this picture of? Oh, this is a horse that has laminitis. Gee, I wonder how that happened. Look how thin the sole is and how the wall has been pushed out that way. You see, what can happen and what does happen a lot of times is because of what they believe, because they're trans putting all the weight um, at the bottom of the wall here, yes, but it's because they're forcing the horse to bear the weight on the sensitive lamina. And so ultimately, um, I mean, there's other reasons too, things that they do in trimming horses, okay, that, that mechanically cause this to go on. But ultimately, finally, what happens is horse just can't take it no more, sole gets so thin, wall gets so far out that the toe of the foot, the inner foot, the laminar bond is broken and the toe of the foot just goes right through the bottom of the sole. 
There you go. There's your laminitis. See, sagittal section of a horse foot with severe laminitis pathology. Gee, I wonder what caused that. See, I, yeah, I know there can be other causes, but the main cause is their traditional belief in how the horse bears the weight on the lamina. Okay, now just to make sure that you understand what that said, just a minute here. Okay, let's go back to this. Where is my, okay, about right up here, about 600 laminar units bear most or all of the body weight in the standing horse. Therefore, inflammation of the dermal lamina known as laminitis is very painful. Remember, they're forcing this horse. What other animal in the world bears its weight on the side of the foot? Every animal in the world bears its weight on the bottom of the foot. Oh, but when it comes to farrier science, things get magical. See? You know, they just bypassed all physical and natural laws. See? So it says about 600 laminar units bear most or all of the weight on the standing horse. Therefore, inflammation of the durable lamina, known as laminitis, is very painful. Hoof horn is also produced by the sole dermis and the frog dermis. An unshod horse on soft ground will bear some body weight on the sole and frog, but the shod foot, get this, the shod foot on a hard surface will bear all the weight on the lamina. You see, they, this is why they, they raise such a big stink about barefoot. And they fight against this hand, tooth, and nail because, my God, you don't want anybody to think that you have been believing a big total farce fallout lie. And that you have been crippling horses and killing horses and killing people for centuries. We don't want anybody to know that. We don't want anybody to believe that. You know, see, see, if you believe that the horse does not bear its weight on the rim of the hoof wall and hence on the lamina. See, again, it's not on the hoof wall. They do not bear, he does not bear the weight on the hoof wall. They do not believe that. They believe he bears the weight on the laminar units. See? Okay? And so for centuries, they have been shooing those feet and forcing those horses to bear weight on sensitive lamina, which is like forcing a ballerina to bear her weight and dance on the rim of her toenail so that she will bear her weight on her nail bed, okay? It's the same exact thing. Now, think about all the money that people spend on laminitis and lame horses. Uh, now, we're not dependent on horses right now, are we? But think about all the centuries that people were dependent, their lives, their very lives depended on the horse. You know, think about that one little family. You know, can't afford nothing. They got one horse. That horse takes them to church on Sunday. That horse plows the field. That horse makes sure they can get groceries. That's all they can afford. Okay, and they're taking this horse to their trusted farrier. You know, and that horse just, something goes on. Okay, finally the shoes ain't holding that foot together. See, it's so deceptive because on the one hand, they're decimating the foot, forcing that foot to be constantly uh, uh, inflammation, to have constant pain, constant inflammation. You know, you don't always limp when you have inflammation, but there's constant, it's a type of pain, right? All right, so 
So they're forcing that horse to have constant inflammation as it is. But the shoe, okay, and the iron nails and everything that's holding it all together. That that, that that's like um, the torture device that 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 keeps the foot um, uh, from totally falling apart while they're slowly destroying the foot. You know, so you don't know that's the reason. Just one day you come out, and my God, your horse can't walk. He's got the laminitis walk with his legs way far ahead, and you don't know what happened. Oh, it must have been something he ate. You know? So, but imagine, okay, how many people's finances and lives were decimated because these guys were laming their horses slowly but surely, and yet they thought they were, you know, the experts. And here's the thing about it, even the farriers and blacksmiths themselves are today and were deceived. Okay? Nobody knows that these people, except these people, and you know, you got your higher echelon and you got your courses and you got your, you know, uh, paying on student loads out the yang forever to get a vet degree. So don't question none of this, you know. Uh, then you got your self-made men, your farriers. I work for myself. Don't question me, you know. It's just an abomination, the whole thing. Now you know why I say this is a cause. It's not a trim. It's a cause. Okay. So you figure, little family little one horse family their life totally depends on this horse and this farrier by what because of what he was taught not because he did it on purpose although you could do it on purpose think about it this farrier blacksmith aka, AKA vet ternary surgeon all right um he he's been doing this to the hoof the whole time finally the horse just totally breaks down laminitis oh my gosh you know well let me tell you what that can des destroy not only that horse destroys the family also how many horses when people were dependent on horses and they wound up getting lame how, how many people i wonder how many people have died i wonder how many families have been financially decimated due to this belief you know this wicked evil insidious belief that came from the dark medieval ages um this is the equivalent to bloodletting okay this would be like if our doctors were still bloodletting and still not washing their hands you know physicians practiced all that junk okay farriers still practice things that were traditions from the dark ages and they never let them go and then it, it then because the vets had to kiss up to them to even get have people you know hire them for anything okay um and and the farriers took the hoof care okay so so there's this unholy alliance between the two you know and i think it needs to be broken I think this marriage made in hell need, I think there needs to be a divorce, you know, yeah, then veterinary science, she needs to divorce her husband of the hoof, which is the farrier, and the farrier needs to get his head out of, yeah, out of the dark ages, <laughs> okay, and quit trying to uh, use pseudoscience and stuff like that to keep trying to prove that the horse uh, bears the weight on the lamina. He doesn't. He doesn't. Okay? Now, just a minute. Now, there's a dead horse's hoof, wild horse, from off of some reservation up in Washington somebody took notice that none of the hoof wall is bearing any weight on this horse okay um let's look at some more of its feet yep 
all rounded off. None of the hoof wall forced. The lamina does not bear the weight of this horse. Notice no jamming in the hairline of the hoof wall being pushed up. Here again, maybe a little bit right here in the pillow. That's that's the area where the horse least rolls over to where his foot, where his hoof wall off. Um, again, no hoof wall, no hoof wall bearing the weight again. But that's not what they think, is it? In this horse, the lamina is not bearing the weight of the horse, and they're doing just fine. Yep. So anyway, um, there you have it. There's where the horse wants to bear its weight. And uh, just a second here. I'm looking for my. And here is where veterinary science wants them to, or not veterinary science. Remember, this didn't come from the vets. This came from the farriers. I don't blame the vets at all. You know, uh, this unholy alliance was uh, a necessity by them just so that veterinarians could survive, okay, because everybody looked to the blacksmith for the answers, and they did not trust the veterinarians. So the veterinarians had to just give them the feet. Okay, here you go. Don't hurt us. You know, let us practice. Okay, but that unholy alliance needs to end. Let's see here. Let's back this up. Okay, again. So they take these dissected hooves that they freeze dry. And for farriers and vets that they sell them, they prepare them so that the hoof wall down here is below the sole. Okay, but we know that uh, the horse does not prefer that. Isn't that right? Let's see, where is it? Right there. See there? Yeah, the whole bottom of that foot is bearing weight as rocks and dirt and everything, you know, catch up into that. So, okay, the unholy alliance between marriage, between veterinary science and the farriers needs to end. And the only way it's going to end is by horse owners and practitioners knowing the truth of what they teach and somehow condensing and and this stuff so that the average horse owner will understand it so that we can deprogram people from their connection to this disgusting horrible awful cruel inhumane ridiculous and ignorant belief all right so let me think if I had anything else to share about that. Um, da -dum -da -dum -dum. Yeah, you know, all you got to do is uh, type in, just a minute here. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Okay, look, here's another fairy journal with some more info on blacksmiths and what they were like. Um, the vets, the first vets, see, those that don't, oh crud, those that don't learn from history are destined to repeat it. Okay? Um, darn it, I didn't want to lose what I was looking at here. Just a minute here. Uh, Okay, this is very interesting read here. Okay, and this is uh, The Veterinarian, a monthly journal of veterinary science, volume 53. I don't know what year this is, but I know it was back in the 1800s when the vet schools first were trying to get established, you know, things like that. So they go into this history up here of how um, veterinary medicine 
was really coming along in the Roman days and in the time of the Greeks, things like that. But when the Roman Empire fell, the whole world descended into darkness as the Holy Roman Empire took over, you know, and that's when uh, people started believing the world were flat and uh, uh, they took away reading and everything from the common man, wouldn't let him read the Bible <laughs> or anything like that, you know. Uh, they just took away learning from everybody. And, uh, okay, so <clears throat> he goes through some, uh, on page 873 here, he goes through some stuff on um, the history and how then we went into the Dark Ages, okay? Um, he talks about the ancient farriers and how they did have some smarts and some wisdom and stuff like that. Now look what he says about the farriers and the blacksmiths. He says, nor were the ancient farriers the rude blacksmiths. And if you've had any dealings with them, you know that for the most part, that is true. Although there are some which are good guys and, you know, legitimate, do a good job, whatever. But he says, nor were the ancient farriers the rude blacksmiths unto which they ultimately degenerated. <laughs> So, they were forgers of armor, uh, both defensive and offensive, at a time when that art was as much more highly cultivated than it has ever been since the invention of gunpowder. On the fall of the Roman Empire, veterinary medicine, like other departments of science, ceased to be cultivated and for a long period fell into the position of a handicraft in which the smiths, shepherds, or herdsmen empirically practice such as treatment, such treatment as tradition taught or experience suggested. It was at about this time that the blacksmith or farrier came to the front and began to assert himself as the great depository of the veterinary art. Um, in classic antiquity, horses were not usually shod with iron. And even, now remember, this is a veterinary journal. Is not that correct? Okay. But see, at this time, again, the, the vets were having to kiss up to these farriers because they were the ones the kings and everybody trusted. Because veterinary surgery, the kind we have today, it was a new thing. Remember, there was no law against just calling yourself a veterinary surgeon and doing whatever. That came later. Okay, it says, it was about this time that the blacksmiths or farrier came to the front and began to assert himself as the great depository of, uh, I could say suppository, but I won't, of veterinary art. In classic antiquity, horses were not usually shod with iron, and even when metal was used for that purpose, it was commonly fastened to the hoof, not with nails, but with thongs or latchets like a sandal. And it was among the barbaric hordes which overran the Roman Empire that the iron shoe fastened with nails came into vogue much about the same time that the tree saddle with stirrups was invented. Um, when used for military purposes, uh, da -da -da -da, was formed of steel or iron and was consequently the work of the smith. To the smith also belonged the forging of the iron shoe and the driving of the nails. The last operation, as we all know, required no small skill, and the smith often caused injuries to the hoof, which he had to do his best to cure. <laughs> About the, and it's the same today, only now they blame it on the horse and not on the smith, farrier. About the same time, also, the use of the actual cautery became common, and from these combined causes, it's easy to see how the farrier came to be regarded as an authority in veterinary medicine. Uh, nor were the ancient fair, and here's where I already read this part, nor were the ancient farriers the rude blacksmiths unto which they ultimately degenerated. Okay, uh, yeah, okay, so there you have it. Not my words. This is, these are the words of a, uh, 
classically trained veterinarian. And let me tell you what, their farrier science has not changed at all. The only thing it did was it infested these veterinary colleges um, because the, the veterinarians had to kiss up to them uh, because they were the trusted authorities. And if the veterinarians didn't kiss up to them, then they probably wouldn't even have got a start, you know, because people trusted these blacksmiths, you know. So, so anyway, it's a marriage made in hell. And I want to see them divorced. All right. So that's uh, Glasgow Veterinary College opening session of 1880. Are you have it? Okay, and there's plenty more on it if you if you want to search and look. So you can't hide the truth no more. All right. Anybody's had to deal with very many of them knows what a bunch of rude buggers they are in the hole. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, now you know what they believe, where they believe, uh, Let's see. What they believe about where the horse bears its weight, not on the wall, like all of you thought, but they put it on the wall to transfer it onto the sensitive lamina of the foot. That right there. Yeah, they, they think that bears the weight right there, like a little spring or something. They believe that the coffin bone is just suspended kind of in midair in the hoof. You know, it's magic. It's magic. Every other horse, every everything else has a foundation. Everything else bears its weight on the bottom of the foot. Oh, but not the horse. Because it's magic. See? Yeah. Okay, and so, and then you have a lot of these vets or, or farriers in some of these colleges doing research on wild horses, like over in Australia, you know, Chris Pollitt and them guys, what do they do? They do everything they can to try and make it look like um, the wild horse model doesn't work. And why is that? Because they don't want you to know that they've been practicing a, a lie. Either, you know, they're totally deceived. They've been practicing a lie for centuries, okay, and causing... Most, you know, they got all these laminitis symposiums and I mean everything else, not realizing they are the ones that are causing it for the most part. Okay? All right. That's all I had to say.